Hi, this is Lance Edwards, and this is Randy Lupke. And this is Financial Independence, A Better Perspective. Randy, you want to you kick us off this one? We got a topic around real estate we're talking about today. I got to ask you this, Lance, because I hear, I'm, I hear this all the time. I hear it from my friends. I hear it from my clients. I hear it from my family. Um, obviously, the real estate market has gone through some changes over the last year, a lot of changes. Uh, and, and interest rates have gone up. Uh, we've just seen a lot of changes in the market, but I'm going to let you talk about this. But here's the fundamental question. Should I be buying real estate today or should I wait for some kind of correction to come along and buy it in the future, right? Is it a good time to buy today or not, right? So with that question in mind, I know there's a lot of nuance to it, go for it. How do you answer that? Because I'm sure you get the same question yourself, right? I, I've been speaking about this ever since rates started doing their thing. And, and, and so the answer is, do you wait? No, you don't wait. And first of all, what do you, Wait for what? What's going to be the magical signal when it says it's okay to get back in the pool? And, and to me, the analogy is if I'm driving down the road downtown and I come to a stoplight, am I going to wait until every green light that I can see in, on the horizon is going to turn green before I move forward? Because if I, if I wait for that, that perfect moment, I'll be here you know, forever. And so, first of all, wait for what? And so, you know, no, don't wait. Now, having said that, you made the point, there's nuances about it. Interest rates have gone up. Um, there's the R word's been dropped around, although that seems to be kind of, kind of quieting down a little bit. Maybe you might have a comment on this in a moment. But, I do, yeah. But I think um, when you're buying during a recession, I'm buying now. I'm actually, I've got a proper project right now I can talk about. I'm buying, but I'm buying it smartly. I'm, I'm being a, you know, a, you know, keen to what's going on in the economy. And I'm using the fact that really we've shifted from a seller's market into a buyer's market to get some better deals because we, we have, made the we shift. have started the, made shift. the shift. We've okay. made the shift. We've made the shift and it's going to accelerate uh, going into Q2 and the, and the rest of the year It's going to accelerate because frankly, there's still some sellers in denial. They still want to get the prices they were, you know, fetching six, nine months ago. You talk to a broker, a commercial broker, there's not a lot of transaction volume going on because their sellers are, are in denial. And if, if a broker does have a listing, sometimes they're just throwing it out there to see what somebody might do. And, and the, broker's, the broker's comment right now is completely different than it was nine months ago. And that they're, they're responsible, just make an offer. <laughs> just make an offer, yeah. please, yeah. please, just, just make an offer. Let me see what I can do. And so that's the environment we're in. So, but I think, um, Now's the time to be buying, and, but buying it right. So, for example, I'll give you an example. A, a project I have, I don't need too many specifics because right in the middle of it right now. But so this is a project that came on after it was listed late. It was listed after rates have gone up. And, and they actually, they should have listed it, you know, like nine months ago. Of course. And so yeah. I, I, yeah. I actually had a question. I mean, I had a conversation with the broker. And I, you know, I, I said to him, you know, you know, because of what rates have done, my lender is really clamped down on what I could offer. It's different than what I could offer, you know, six, nine months ago. Mm -hmm. And he actually interrupted me at that point And he said, I know where you're going with this. You're, 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 really, you're asking me, is my seller open to creative financing or seller financing? That's what you're asking. That's, that's exactly what I'm asking. He said, yes, he is. Yes, he is open to that. And, and so, the offer we put in front of him and that we're going back and forth on right now and on just some of the, the, some of the details, basically my offer was, okay, I'll give you the price that you would have liked to have gotten nine months ago in exchange for, you're going to give me the interest rates I would have gotten nine months ago because it, the, math is still got, the math is still going to make sense. And I call it, Randy, I call it my share strategy, like the share, C-H-E-R. You know, share had this song, um what was the name oh, of that song sure. play, playback time go back time go back uh, playback time uh so, so we're gonna we're gonna play back time we're gonna we're gonna play back time i'll give you the price you would have gotten nine months ago you give me the interest rate we would have gotten nine months ago and that's what we're doing we're doing i'm i'm taking over payments on his mortgage of 4.25 percent 
with his bank's approval, give him a second, a little bit above that, mm-hmm. and and the price that he wanted. And I've got a you know I got a great project that's gonna make sense, and I can buy it. You know, cash flow, which is the number one criteria mm-hmm. that I teach. For my, it's got to it's got to pay for itself. It's got a cash flow, so I've got a strongly cash flowing building when I buy it with upside to it, as classically we have in these mom and pop owned apartment buildings, they, they never raise the rent. They never do these things professional operators will do. So there's mm-hmm. all this upside to it. And so that's an example of a good project that I got because it's a buyer's market and we can have the conversation. And so, um, yes, you should be buying, but I want you to be selective. The math, the, the math tests have not changed. These properties still have the cash flow. Mm-hmm. That's just a fact of life. And you say, so you've got to, you've got to buy them right. And so I'll, let me let me pause there. Some other things I want to add, but I'm, I'm gonna give you a chance to maybe throw in your two cents or ask any questions around what I may have just said. Thanks. Yeah, this is one of the fun parts about these conversations because we both come from different perspectives, right? And we both think outside the box, right? And so, one of the th- people asked me that too. You know, should I buy a house, whatever? And I was, they said, well, when's the best time to buy real estate? And I said, the best time to buy real estate is always 12 years ago. Yeah, right. And 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 that's a purposeful number because if you could you can think back at any period of time, twelve years ago, real estate was worth less than it is later. Even there's ups and downs in between, right? That twelve year window, you're always going to end up making a profit, right? And the point is, you know, when you buy real estate, it's a long term purchase. You're not buying it. I mean, we get in these markets where we can flip. I had a client last year bought a house for three weeks and made three hundred thousand dollars on a flip. You know. Right. That was last year. Right. It was just one of those deals. Not going to do that today. But uh, the point is that um, I think you said it. You should always be looking to buy the real estate. You should always be looking for the deals. It's still got to be the right deal. Right. And and there's good deals when real estate markets are hot. There's good deals when, when it's a buyer's market, when it's a seller's market, when rates are up or rates are down. There's always a deal to be had. See, it, it, the, the trouble, I think, with what we've gone through the last probably three, four years is people got so caught up. It's like an auction environment, right? They're so caught up in the yeah. excitement, right? They're overpaying, you know, for, you know, all, they're doing stupid deals. They're doing stupid deals for too high a prices that are never going to work. And now they're really in trouble, right? Because they overpaid and, you know, their interest rates are you know, like that deal you're talking about. You know, they, they, the, the, they're, they over leveraged, they couldn't refinance their lender and then they're calling the loan. You know, they're going to, they're going to take, take a bath on it. You now they, they, well, they, that, 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 that is why, that's why we're going to be moving more and more into a buyer's market is because the people in the case of apartments, a lot of people that were buying apartments and syndicators and they were buying them for a three-year flip. They were going to, they bought it with the intention they were going to raise the rents, raise the occupancy, yep. and then sell it at a, at a new high price into a seller's market. It's a fine strategy. And what they did, they put in place mo- loans that were floating rate, adjustable rate mortgages, because they, their whole time was, was no more than three years. And if it was adjustable rate mortgages, they could, they could avoid paying prepayment penalties, which would dig into their profits. Right. So they, you know, they they got mortgages maybe two and a half percent, three and a half percent, three percent on adjustable, a three year three year balloon, never envisioning what was going to happen to interest rates. Mm-hmm. And so now that those rates are resetting. So now the resets, their mortgage rates going up, their mortgage payments going up. Just six or seven cash percent. flow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, their cash flow is squeezed, if not negative. And when it comes time to refinance out. Now they can't refinance out because the mortgage rates are so high and they're stuck. And those projects, it's going to, it's going to, they're going to be dumped on the market, which is going to put downward pressure on prices. It's going to become even more of a buyer's market as they roll in later this year. And, and uh, so that's what's, you know, that's what's coming down the pike. That we say we move more into a buyer's market. Yep, I, I agree. And my, again, my 12 year rule or, or rule of thumb is again, based on reality, right? 12 years, you can't find a 12 year period where homes were more expensive 12 years ago than they were 12 years later, just didn't going to exist. Um, another little rule of thumb is, uh, uh, again, I got from this from one of my investor clients, you should buy any property with the idea that you'll keep it forever, but you'll be willing to sell it at any time. Right. Uh, because if you, you know, keep it forever because it makes sense, it's a good deal. But if the right offer comes along, you're not married to it. Right. Um, but if you don't, if you're not willing to keep it forever, you shouldn't be buying it. 
it's just that's that's you know if you flip it great but you should be keep it forever what do you think that's 100 percent correct I, you know that's i'm buying them for you know i buy them for me and my wife and and with no intent to sell them if we sell them we'll 1031 them into something bigger but most likely i would refi cash them out and roll them into something else but i, I want to make i'm gonna give a i saw this chart uh, cbre came out with a chart in december and it looked at in this example, on the y-axis, they had home values, and on the x-axis, they had time going back 60 years. From 1960, 1962 to 2022, it's a chart of home values. And of course, it, you know, it was rising. Mm-hmm. And then they had 11 recession bans over those 60 years. And in looking at that chart, you can visualize this. There was only one, during there was only one time period. There was only one recession when home values did not go up through the recession, and it was the 2008 recession, which was really a 2008 credit crisis. Mm-hmm. The recession was a byproduct of the fact mm-hmm. there was no credit available. So you see, home values went down because the market was dumping prices because nobody could get financing mm-hmm. to buy real estate. But the other ten. The other 10, if you had bought at the beginning of the recession, at the end of the recession, your your values would have gone up. Here's another example. Everybody can relate to this, right? When COVID hit, March of 2020, we went through this little, you know, they they defined a little bit of recession because everybody was kind of freaked out. My toilet paper. They wanted to get toilet paper. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Yeah, throw your money in toilet paper. There's there's the (laughs) ultimate commodity. And, but, and if you had waited, and you saw what happened with you know real estate and it's like the greatest gain ever after coming out of COVID recession. So yeah, I don't. You just I think you're spot on. You just buy and wait. The old adage is you don't you don't you don't wait to buy real estate. You buy real estate and wait. It will come back up. And I've done the math, and it's approximately if you look at the if you look at over a five year period of ROI, you make your ROI from owning apartments, for example, you get you get ca- get five years of cash flow, you get five years of paying down your mortgage, and you get five years of appreciation. Mm-hmm. And it, that ROI will be between thirty to forty percent on your cash per year or more. Mm-hmm. But if you break it down, seventy percent, seventy percent of that total ROI is coming from the appreciation. Oh, sure. Coming from the leverage. Because of the leverage. Yeah. The leverage. And so you, there's going to be some point to where things, and it's not going to be continuously never stay going. It could be at some point, it may be kind of doing this, and all of a sudden, it's got, it's got the right economy, boom. You know, you can raise rents, values go up, and that's, you're going to catch it during that window. And so it, it's just going to buy it, and, and, but you got to buy it right. It's got a cash flow. Like you said, you got to be willing to hang on to it because it's just feeding you. It's just it's just paying for itself. It's just paying yeah. for itself. No, I agree. I agree. And again, if you if you jump on the bandwagon with everybody else, you're probably too late. You should be looking. You should be looking when nobody else is. And and people, you know, they're on the side. A lot of people are on the sidelines right now. That's a great time to go shopping, <laughs> right? Is and, and and interest rates are high, but they're going to go lower again. They're they're, they're you know the. You know, when I first started in the business, mortgage rates were right around 15 percent. Uh, and, you know, they were celebrating when they went under 10. Getting them down to two, is, it wasn't healthy. It was, it, 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 you know, the, the average rate should be about five or six percent. We're, we were like almost a little over seven on a 30 year fixed rate. Today we're down below, below seven and, you know, mid sixes. Uh, six and a quarter mm-hmm. ish, you know. Um, so we're getting down there to right where the rates are really great again on 30 year fixed rate loans. I, I think, Randy, I think people got spoiled, these three and a half percent mortgages, four percent mortgages. It's crazy. I mean, when I was growing up, I can remember my mother talking about she bought our home, you know, in the early 60s with a four percent mortgage. And at the time, you know, the same, same time period, you was, you know, double digit, 15. Couldn't, I couldn't even imagine four percent. Mm-hmm. Now everybody's mm-hmm. spoiled by it. And and we had a period there where you said it, everybody was paying too much and it got an auction mentality and it mm-hmm. just it, a lot of stupid stuff was being done which goes back to my point stick to the fundamentals make sure the cash flows there don't get too aggressive on your pro forma and don't let your lender get too aggressive on their underwriting what, what amazes me is the lenders will make these loans they'll they'll get caught up in it as well 
they're mm-hmm. making loans that really sh- they shouldn't be making. And, mm-hmm. and it, a lot of them are going to, I'm going to come back. They're going to come mm-hmm. back. So just buy them right. Buy them right. I want to go back to your point about seller financing too. Um, Cause a lot of times people are afraid to ask the seller about, you know, are they willing to carry back? Are they willing to, uh, and in the reality is it's actually in, in a lot of circumstances, it's good for both sides, right? Your seller got a higher price and they're actually getting a pretty decent, decent rate of return on their money anyway, right? They're, for their seller carry back. So they're coming out winning on both sides and you got a nice property, right? And yes, hundred percent correct. He got, he got, he got his price. He's got passive income that'll pay him. He, he just steps away from the property and yeah. His tax situation, he had bought, he'd owned this property for like 17 years. So his basis was low. Yeah. So he was going to get clobbered on capital gains tax if he got all of his cash on a cash sale. So now we're doing an installment sale with yeah. seller financing so he can yeah. spread that out over years and, and, um, and avoid that tax and avoid that. So that's, that's really, and, and that frankly was a, in his situation, was a very dominant part of the decision process was how to spread out his tax bill and yeah, not have to pay I, it for years. It's one of the beautiful things about real estate. And you, the, the trick is you, you just got to understand what the seller really wants. And sometimes the seller doesn't even know what they really want, right? And so you, you, you basically helped him understand what he cared about. You got your price. You got passive income now. You've mitigated your taxes. You're not going to get slammed with this big tax bill. It's going to be spread out over time. You know, you solved all kinds of problems for him, and you got a great property. Yeah, I mean, it's just th- those are the deals. That you, you know, they're out there, but you got to ask for them. And you got to ask. You just got to you got to ask for. It. And and you know, everybody's. You know, we're kind of raised in school. The way you buy real estate, you put up a hefty down payment, and you go get a loan, and you buy it. Well, that's one way to do it, but there's a lot of other ways to do it that are more, you know, in the world of creative. And they're really not all that creative. It's not like seller financing just got made up last week. It's been around forever. Oh, People forever. have yeah. done this. And, it, and, it's, and so it's just, it's just a matter of asking and, and, under, and, and understanding what's important to the seller and having a conversation mm-hmm. about, well, here's some options I can give you. You know, let's, let's make it work for both of us. And that's really what he, that's what he and I did. Let's make it work for both of us. And you know, here we are on the verge of getting across the finish line. I love it. I love it. Well, I think you, you answered my question and you probably answered it for all of our listeners too. Um, this is a good place to be buying real estate. You just got to be looking, you got to be smart. You don't want to be caught in the frenzy and um, <clears throat> you know, the right deal comes along. And I think the last point we both just made is, you know, you really got to take the time to understand what the seller's trying, what their needs are, what their concerns are, what their needs are. And then if you can make a deal that, uh, that satisfies those, you know, it's not just about price. I guess that's another way to look at it. It's not always just about price. It's not. And I will share with you when I'm buying a property, you know, a lot of people think price is the number one thing. I'd be like, I got the price. The price is, it's not the number one thing to me. My, the what's most, most important to me is what can I do the property to improve the performance? The, the big thing that I, I always say a lot, I'm not buying real estate. I'm buying businesses. These are small apartment True. businesses. Yep. I've got clients who are my residents. I got income. I got rent. And so I look at it. What, what additional services can I provide or amenities can I provide to raise those rents or add other income to get more fees out of it? Because every time I raise the rent, every time I raise the other income, not only does it give me more cash flow, but it geometrically raises the value yeah. of these properties. And like I'm saying, 70% of the ROI comes from what I do to the value so I'm looking at a property. I, w- I want to get a price so I can, you know, cash flow today. But I'm more interested in what can I do with that? Not a lot of effort, not a lot of energy to raise these rents. So a lot of times, I mean, I, I bought a project uh, last year, Randy, where I raised the rents $100 just to go to market. I didn't do anything. I, that's a $100 rent bump, right. and a $100 rent bump is worth a $16,000 per door increase in value. How many product. doors? We've since 56 doors. Oh, we'll do the math. <laughs> yeah. And we've and we've yeah. and we've and we've, and we've <laughs> since then have raised the rent two hundred dollars on that same property with a little bit of interior update. So that's thirty-two thousand dollars per door value increase by giving better service, 
doing some in, uh, interior updates and just running a better business. And so mm -hmm. that's the project everybody's looking for because the money's made on the, the real money's made on the appreciation side, the real ROI. Yeah. And just to be clear to listeners too, that this is not this, what you're just talking about doesn't work with single family residences. The markets drive the values of single family residences. This works with apartments. And it, you, like you said it perfectly, you're buying little, little businesses, right? And so you're driving up the profitability of the business. You drive up the exponential value of that business. And you can do that with rental, with apartments. You can't do that with single family residences. Can't That's correct. Because commercial has a thing called forced appreciation, which is there's a, there's a little formula that says if you raise the rent X amount, the value goes up this amount. And that's what the whole business is based upon. Yeah, it's, but the whole whole business is based upon getting those extra income out of it. And and one other thing, this, this point about, I'm gonna make one other point about the businesses. I think this is an important point because I find that, you know, my area is small apartment, owned, small, small apartments. These are two to 100 unit uh, buildings. You know, I'm buying in the 30 to 100 unit range. Typically they're mom and pop owned mom and pop self-managed which means mom and pop treat it more like a hobby not like a business it's, it's a mm -hmm. hobby and they don't want to raise the rents because they don't want to lose mildred or upset you know they don't want to they don't want to tip anything they don't want to tip anything but we because it's a business for us not a hobby we put in place professional management we have a plan to provide more services we have a plan to have a relationship with these residents. We have a plan to raise the rents, be able to show value for that rent increase. And we have staff and we have a team. And, you know, Randy, I don't spend an hour per week on my, pro I mean, I, I, I'm just no, oh. no exaggeration. I don't spend an hour per week on my properties because we have the systems in place. We have the team in place and we, it's run like a business, like any other business would be. And, you know, I, I just get involved, I get involved up front to put the plan together and they, they run it. I have a meeting once a week and, that's it. So that's so some people, I think, have the wrong perception that they've got to jump in and they're going to deal with tenants and toilets and they're going to. No, no, no. If I had to do that, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now yeah, because I wouldn't yeah. be doing that for more than five minutes. But <laughs> if, if, if you're a small business owner right now, or you're a self-employed small business owner, you know, you picking up an apartment building is taking the skills you've already learned as a small business owner and applying it on an apartment building. But you can get teams pre-assembled. You can hire management companies who know how to do this. You just got to you just, just got to add the vision and the objectives, and then manage it like a business. That's the key point. I've you know I really want to share with people who, who thinking about apartments, but thinking they don't want to deal with tents and toilets. You know, you're not. I don't want yeah. you to do that. You're going to be you're going to be a business owner. Well, that that Lance Edwards is why I asked you that question because this is what you do. <laughs> this is that was great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, should we call this a wrap? I think I've, I've got everything I wanted to share. Uh, it was, for today. It was, this it was great. It was, yeah, it was a great answer to that question. Thank you. All right. So anyone, if you'd like to check out our show notes, as always, you can go to our website, fibetter.com, fibetter.com. And if you'd like to learn more about apartments or small apartments, you can go to my website, lanceedwards.com. You can, a lot of free resources there. You can get my book. How to Make Big Money in Small Apartments. I've got another book coming out here soon called Apartment Alchemy, 50 Ways Small Apartment Owners Can Boost Their Cash Flow and Their Wealth. And you can get that book as well. And by the way, when you buy these books, send money to the Intrepid Fallen Heroes Fund. So help out our, help our, our injured military. Uh, Randy, if they want to get a hold of you, how do, they, how do they reach out to you? Best way to reach me is to go to my website, lifetimeparadigm.com. Um, that's L-I-F-E. T I M E, and then paradigm is P A R A D I G, like George M, like Mary.com. Randy at lifetimeparadigm.com. A lot of free information. Everything on our website is free. Great information there. Be sure to check out our financial independence toolkit. It's awesome. It's And it's free as well. And there's a link on the website if you want to send me any direct questions. And that's really the best way to reach me lifetimeparadigm.com. All right, very good. All right, until the next time, everyone, go put put this work, this, these ideas to work. Take care. Thanks, Lance. Take care. Thank you.